Hi, my name is Marianne Piet. I'm from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and it's my pleasure to give you an introduction to research about the future of predictive uh, modeling and district energy systems. These are important pieces of low energy future cities and future neighborhoods. I'm going to first start with an overview of district energy systems. Basically, these are systems where the pipes are underground. And you'll see that these are located all over the United States. There's a lot more of them in Europe. The good thing about these systems is they help us to have lower energy. If you have buildings that one building's in heating and another is in cooling, you can actually save a lot of energy because the waste heat from one building can be used by another and vice versa. So when we have buildings, uh, office buildings and, and homes and schools and hospitals in clusters, and you put those together, you can have very efficient heating and cooling systems. So the future of cities where you have a lot of dense heating and cooling is to have very low energy systems. And the majority of these in the United States are in colleges and universities, um, but they're in many building types. And we're going to start to see them more in urban systems in, in cities in the United States. So what's interesting about the history of these systems is they actually started in New York City, where we had a lot of boilers. And in order to make it safer, uh, the early systems were very high temperature, and they were built big boilers for groups of buildings, and that was safer than managing a lot of small boilers. So the history of these systems um, from many decades ago was, was started here in New York with, with district heating systems. Then we started adding, uh, making them more efficient at adding combined heat and power and generating electricity. Um, over time, we tried to make them more energy efficient, and now we're switching to renewable integration and tighter networks at different temperatures because when you generate heat like steam or very hot water the systems can be in it very energy efficient so I'm going to give you an introduction into the ways these systems are changing and the kinds of opportunities in the future of these district energy systems at Stanford University uh, there's been an interesting retrofit that's happened where they've gotten rid of the combined heat and power system cogeneration and they don't want any fossil fuel. So it's an all electric system with heat recovery chillers. And I'll describe that in a minute. At UC Merced, which is another campus in California, not only did they design the district heating and cooling, but they did a lot of work on the buildings so that the buildings didn't need as much heating and cooling. And then there's a system in Berkeley uh, that I'll talk a little about. And that system is more like what we see in Switzerland, which are bi-directional ambient loop technologies. And these technologies actually have one pipe, and it can change direction between heating and cooling. And these bi-directional systems actually are not even insulated underground. So we use ambient loop systems with significant amount of heat pumps locally. So these are some of the most energy efficient, and we can put solar thermal, seasonal storage, and waste heat integration to make the district systems of the future much more efficient than what we see today. So this is what the Stanford system looks like. It's got a hot water chiller and two chill water tanks. Uh, these hot water tanks and the chill water tanks have heat recovery chillers. So the chillers are making both heat and chill water at the same time. And they use a model predictive control technology that predicts how much energy they need over the next few days. And it creates that much energy. It does it at night when it's, when it's cooler or in the day when it's warmer. So the model is helping us to reduce energy use. And I'll talk a little about that a little bit more in the presentation. Now, from an engineering perspective, uh, the way we think about the performance of these systems, uh, there's a variety of different engineering metrics that I want to introduce you to. Because when we think about district heating and cooling, district scale neighborhood systems, um, the metrics uh, are, are quite different. Basically, we're moving away from uh, fossil fuel systems to more all electric systems. Um, so a coefficient of performance is a first law metric that looks at the energy efficiency of technologies. This is conventionally the way we rate heat pumps. Uh, exergy efficiency has to do with uh, how much work you're able to create from a particular type of system. And it, from an engineering perspective, it's a, it's a, it's a more absolute metric. Carbon emissions is, is something we're all familiar with. And many of these systems can have zero carbon. We can have all electric systems with renewable integration. We can have seasonal thermal storage. We can use waste heat from other buildings. 
and our goal is to have very low carbon emissions. Generation, historically, a lot of these district systems have cogeneration. So I mention this because in the past, a lot of these systems are generating electricity, but we're moving towards these systems being all electric, providing heating and cooling. So there's a variety of different metrics that have to be kept in mind when we're thinking about rating these different types of technologies. I'm not going to go through all the data in this slide, but just to give you an idea of this first law of efficiency, we look at the energy desired over the energy required, and we can rate the efficiency of a, of a, a system and compare their performance. Over here, this, this new Stanford system compared to the cogeneration is much more, has much higher exergy efficiency, um, but you see when we do a first law efficiency, it's lower. And then here's the, the tons per person, uh, and these campuses, this one in Merced actually is still being built out for more students, uh, and the, the, uh, the Stanford one and the, the uh, uh, the cogen and the, the existing solar system, I mean the uh, renewable energy system, have um, a, both a higher and a lower uh, tons per per um, per person. So these metrics give us an idea of we, we're moving away. We do not want high. These are GHG tons, so we do not want these kinds of metrics. We want here about one metric ton per person, and that gives us an idea when we compare these campuses how the different systems perform. Now, um, I'm going to show you the generation of technologies here. I mentioned the New York City, historically done for safety, uh, the distribution network that is now being installed at Stanford, uh, the distribution and the buildings, which Berkeley's considering. But one of our most aspirational uh, district systems is being built in Switzerland, and I'll introduce you to that one. The Swiss system is an underground system with seasonal thermal storage. So they actually put, they make the, the earth warmer in the summer by using solar thermal to use the earth as seasonal storage. And then in the winter, the earth is warmer and they can use that to, to heat the buildings. So you're gonna to start to see very regional differences in these systems. And when you have ambient loop, meaning the temperature of the water that's being piped around is, is the temperature of the earth. The heat pumps are much more efficient when they're underground with a constant temperature than to see a cold winter day like it is today here in New York City. If you have a heat pump, an all electric heat pump, that's seeing temperatures like 20 or 30 degrees Fahrenheit, it's much less efficient than if it was ground coupled. So these district heating and cooling systems use the different kinds of resources. They can have solar thermal, earth coupling, uh, renewable uh, generation of various types. And the Swiss government is putting in $25 million a year to try to create these systems. And they're giving us an idea of the, the performance extreme for these various kinds of systems. Now, um, what's really exciting about these technologies, and I'm going to go ahead and show you all the pieces of the graphic, is that we're creating models that allow us to model the f energy flow, the performance of the heat pumps, maybe coupling with the San Francisco Bay water. And in this example here, instead of putting cooling towers on buildings, we're actually gonna dump the heat into the ocean or into the bay. Now, today, when you run a building, you pay the bill once a month and you turn the heating and cooling systems on. But in the future, you'll have a model that's looking at the outside temperature, the temperature you want inside, how many people are there, the price of electricity, and you can actually use a model to optimize all the set points and make sure it's continuously running as efficient as possible. So these systems look something like this in a building where we're actually uh, collecting data on the weather forecast, the, grid, the price of electricity, and the building. And we're allowing us to minimize the costs, improve the energy efficiency. And this data allows the building to make sure the fans aren't left on, the chill water temperature is optimized, and we create open source tools that are done at the room level, the building level, and the campus or district level. So this is a very exciting time for the building controls area and the district systems where we can actually model these systems and create the metrics to make sure we're not wasting energy and we're running it as efficiently as possible. So this is my last slide. Um, we're changing from a time where we've had very simple in controls in buildings to adaptive, grid-aware, model-predictive systems for grids and community-scale district systems. So that's an important 
topic that I talked about is choosing the metrics, whether it's efficiency or greenhouse gases per person, uh, designing the system for modular growth. A lot of those ambient systems I talked about uh, can be built onto over time. And then we use the design model to continuously operate and optimize the system. And that is a major change in the way we control both buildings themselves as well as these district scale systems. So it's a very exciting time uh, for us to use these engineering data in real-time operations for energy-efficient buildings and uh, district heating and cooling systems. Thank you.